Uh, how many of you have been enjoying the Memorial Stone Sunday School, learning about the past, and we've been getting good uh, history lessons? Uh, part of that, unless you were here from the very, very early days, there are so many people that you don't know their stories and people that have been launched out in ministry, some that you don't even know. In every conference, of course, we have so many workers out, it's not possible to meet them all. He doesn't know I'm gonna do this, but I want Roger Fisher to come. We have Roger and Linda uh, uh, Fisher. Come up here, Roger. Amen. They are from our church. And I want to, uh, yeah, both of them come up here. Yes, I wanna see them both. Amen. You come up here and just, you can sit here for a second. Uh, Roger and Linda were saved in our church. Linda uh, is Nancy Wren's uh, sister, and you know in our church. But I've got a picture here I want you to put up on the screen. Here is Roger and Gary Guptill when they first came in. And uh, so we, we have workers that are out that we don't get to, to see. I want you to see them. Occasionally you see their pictures on the screen, but I want you to see who they are. And then I also, I want Roger to come, if he would. I want him just to quickly tell the testimony of how he got saved and then give us a report of what God is doing in Santa Maria, California. Let's welcome Roger when he comes. Okay. Thank you, Roger. God bless. You can sit down if you want. Thank you. Praise God. Um, well... Gary Guptill and I got saved 50 years ago, <laughs> and so um, I don't even tell hardly any more work in the streets, and when we're out reaching in Santa Maria, I don't even bring that up, hardly any at all, because uh, it was so long ago. Um, you know, they don't know anything about World War II or 50 years ago, and so, but um, it's a miracle of God that could never have been orchestrated um, other than the hand of God. And so I will try to very quickly um, just hit a few highlights. Um, when I was in college in, in um, a branch of the University of Wisconsin, um, I was a bartender, and there was a guy that would um, come in. He was an obnoxious guy, and we'd throw him out the back door when he'd get drunk, and... Uh, uh, we did that a number of times, but I happened to have a speech class with this guy, and his name was Dave Fink. We have a Dave Fink that's pastoring, but it's not the same guy. And I had a speech class with this guy, and uh, he, on an impromptu speech, he uh, brought the gospel, did it, did it a little bit on the board, and that was the first time I'd ever heard the gospel. And I believe that was probably in about August of, of 1972. And um, he said he had gotten saved. He had a buddy, a guy that I knew that I was playing uh, ball with in, uh, at Stout, Mark Grasky, that he had gotten saved. We heard that he had uh, got, he's a Jesus freak or something. And I think this was Campus Crusade. But anyway, let that go down the road. On we go in our lives, and uh, through a number of circumstances, um, Gary Guptill and I ended up making our way uh, to Flagstaff, and from there just get out of a blizzard that was coming. We were heading to Phoenix, and in the process of that, we remembered that Gary's dad's best man lived in, in Prescott, and we knew um, they would feed us. I knew those people, too. You know, we were... We were we, <laughs> No, this is real. This is, this, we weren't, you know. And so we knew that would happen. I knew those people. They knew my family as well. But in the process of that, we stopped. Uh, we thought Prescott was Prescott Valley when we made our way. And uh, there was nothing out there at all at that time. And um, we ended up stopping at a little cafe that was there. And I don't know whether it was, um, might have been Barb Copeland. But anyway, I, I think when we asked if they knew these people, like, um, they, I, I think they, it might have been that that individual that we were looking for, 
that guy's wife was working part-time in that little cafe. And so, um, <laughs> it's a miracle. I hate this when it happens. <clears throat> And so anyway, we ended up coming to church, went, got invited by Harold Warner and uh, the Boys Club uh, concert. And it was just before they were going to tear that place down, I believe. But either way, uh, we ended up being invited to come to church on, uh, on February 4th of 1973. <coughs> Dang, I hate this. <laughs> anyway... A uh, number of things just brought the gospel to our lives. We got saved, and um, it's gone that fast, um, but it's been a tremendous ride. And if you just have gotten saved, uh, whatever the circumstances uh, might be, God has orchestrated uh, what, uh, to bring you to salvation. And um, uh, the best thing you could do is to follow through and just be stubborn enough not to ever give up and keep on keeping on. And God will bring your life uh, all the way full circle. And um, uh, eventually we'll make heaven, uh, heaven our home. And this little short life that we have here is, is nothing compared to what God has for you and I uh, throughout uh, eternity. And so um, I'm uh, just... Uh, uh, was we were crazy enough to believe it then, and God has so radically changed our lives, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, the eternity with a living God. And through the years, just in various places, we had um, a pastor. I think uh, Santa Maria is the fifth stop for my wife and I, and so I've drug her all the way from the west coast to the east coast, and uh, God has helped us in all of those times. And so it's just a wonderful thing. By the way, Santa Maria, we're doing well, and uh, God is really helping us there. And uh, I love California. I know, I know, I know. You're. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than where I'm at. It's a great opportunity. Have an influx. The majority of our church is. Um, uh, we don't have a bunch of vatos, nothing like that. It's a um, just a laboring, hardworking. Um, Mexican immigrant, a very uh, solid group of core people, and uh, they have connections throughout Mexico, and so uh, anybody of their family comes and visits, we can send them to Mexico, and God uh, wonderfully, and th so thanks God, uh, thank God through the years, Pastor Mitchell, uh, Pastor Mitchell Sr., amen, and uh, now Greg have invested in us again and again and again and again, helped us along the way. And so I thank the Prescott congregation. Um, we would have never uh, survived uh, without that uh, reference in our life. So thank God. Lord bless you tonight. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. God bless you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Amen. These are some of the quiet heroes of our fellowship. We have workers. Uh, all over America laboring like this. So we are very grateful, Roger and Linda, doing a great work for God. Amen. Thank God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Some years back, uh, you know the, the story, they uh, dubbed it the miracle on the Hudson. And that is that uh, an airplane shortly after takeoff in New York uh, hit a flock of birds, knocked out the engines. Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger had to crash land the plane in the Hudson River in New York when the engines were knocked out. Listen to this. They interviewed him. He was able to successfully do that. Everyone survived. Sully Sullenberger said, I remember vividly as a child knowing that I needed to be prepared for whatever might come. For 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits in the bank of experience and education and training. And on January 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. So what that man is saying is, in life... I was ready. 
Being ready is a powerful part of all of life. The text that we're going to read, this is the Passover. They are about to be delivered from Egypt. They have no full understanding, but God says you are to eat a very special meal. We're only going to look at one verse out of the whole story, and in this, God says, when you eat it, you are to be dressed and ready to go. And in that little statement, it is so powerful because it is a picture of all of salvation. There's not a single person here. It doesn't apply to you. God says we are to be ready to go. I want to preach a message entitled, Ready to Go. One verse, Exodus 12, 11, I'm reading from the New Century Version. It says, this is the way you must eat it. You must be fully dressed as if you were going on a trip. You must have your sandals on and your walking stick in your hand. You must eat it in a hurry, for it, this is the Lord's Passover, ready to go. Let's begin. I want to talk about the nature of salvation. In this story, God's people, are they have been enslaved as a nation or as a group of people for 400 years. On this night, they're going to be set free. You know that in the Bible, Egypt is a picture, it's, a, it's symbolic of sin. In this Passover meal, the lamb that is going to be killed that night, the blood put on the door frame, which is looking ahead to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of salvation. Salvation brings freedom. Exodus 12, 27, you shall say, this is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and he delivered our households. Salvation brings deliverance. Jesus sets you free from sin, but they're about to enter into this freedom and God says, here is the attitude you enter into this freedom that we call salvation. The Passover made them ready to go. Verse 11, this is the way you must eat it. You must eat it fully dressed as if you were going on a trip. See, God is saying something about salvation. I don't know how long ago, whether you are like Brother Fisher and it was 50 years ago, or whether it was just a week ago that you got saved, the moment you get saved, God says you are headed someplace. Our brother just alluded to this. Hebrews eleven thirteen. all these people, uh, great people died in faith. They said they were like visitors and strangers on earth. And Philippians 3, 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, the moment you got saved, you are headed someplace. Salvation is not the time you arrived, it's when you started the journey. So why does he tell us that? What does that mean for you and I practically? How does it impact our lives? It has to do with our values. God is saying you're going someplace because your life is not in Egypt. Egypt is a type of sin. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or the things in the world. So that means if you're headed someplace, the decisions that you make in life, they're not going to match Egypt because we're not from Egypt. We are headed someplace. We're not going to live here forever. Matthew 19, 22. Here's a man who wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus pointed out that it would affect his finances. You have to make different financial decisions. And the young man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In other words, he said, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I still want to live with the values of this world. And Jesus said, it won't work that way. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust 
destroy thieves, break in and steal, but lay up treasures in heaven. Moth and rust will not destroy. Thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When my wife got saved, she was 15 years old. Her parents, both Catholic, their father, of course, not not a practicing Catholic at all, just a, a sinner. And so it, it was hard for him to get his head around why Lisa wanted to go to church, but he grudgingly accepted that until he found out that Lisa was giving money. And, and he, he is from here. And he was, why would you give money away? The point of life is to get more money in, right? You're giving money away because Lisa was going someplace and she is not from here. That is what salvation does, but it doesn't just have to do with, uh, uh, with money. It actually has to do with every part of life. That is, we make decisions based on this idea, we're headed someplace. This text says that they were to eat with their shoes on. In those days, they didn't have a nice dining table and seats. If you ever have uh, uh, seen how they did this, often it was something you were reclining. Your feet might be near someone's face. So what you would do is take your shoes off, bathe your feet. That's how you eat. But God says, you're going someplace. I don't care what the culture says. If the culture says that's okay, you are to make different decisions. It has to do with your readiness. Verse 11, be fully dressed as if you're going on a trip. Have your sandals on and your walking stick in, in your hand. God is saying at any moment, the word can come out. You can go free from Egypt. I don't want you, when you hear the call, it's time to go. I don't want you to be saying, I got to pack. I, I got to start getting ready. We got to do some ironing and we got to do some decanting of all the potions and <laughs> creams that ladies have or whatever. No, he says, I want you to be ready when the call comes. This is how every believer in Jesus Christ, he says, don't take your values from here. And secondly, you are to live ready at all times. Believers in Jesus Christ must be ready for death. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed for men to die once. And after this, the judgment. God says, make sure when you live your life that you live ready. This is the problem. There are believers in Jesus Christ. They have been born again. They have had an experience, but now they're starting to drift from God. In, they're, not, they're not saying, I want to be a Satanist and a serial killer. They're saying, you know, I, I shouldn't probably be doing this, but I'll get it right later on. God says, that is not how you live. You must be Ready, the old saying, too many people who planned on getting right with God at 1159 wind up dying at 1158. It was Jim Elliott, the famous missionary. He said, make sure when it comes time to die, all you need to do is die. In other words, you know, what? Death now? I got to get ready for death. He says, no, you have your shoes on. You are ready at all times. Or then we are ready for the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God. The dead will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to beat the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Everybody has a meeting point with God. Some people it's going to be through death and some people it's going to be through the rapture. The Bible says as fast as you can blink, every true believer will be, the word here, caught up, snatched, disappear from off of this earth, making way for judgment to come in, the, in all of the earth. And the Bible says, if that is coming, be 
ready. Matthew 24, 44, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. There was a British explorer named Robert Falcon Scott. He was determined to be the first to reach the South Pole. He led an expedition so he could get there first, but he made mistakes. He didn't properly prepare for the harsh uh, uh, conditions in the Antarctic. He chose, how are we going to get around in the Antarctic? He brought ponies. Ponies are not a good choice in the freezing cold of the Antarctic. He didn't bring enough warm clothing. He didn't bring enough supplies. The men had never been in cold climate. Absolutely, they got sick. They were, uh, got injured. Another team arrived before them. Rolled Admonson reached the pole first because they were better prepared. Scott's team got there weeks later, running low on supplies, and they never made it home. They all died because they weren't ready. And so God is saying, make sure that you are ready to go. Let's talk second about the spirit of salvation. In this text, it contains a promise. God had promised. Actually, he had 400 years before made a promise to Abraham, who was their ancestor of all of these people living in Egypt now, the Jewish people living there. And God said, 400 years, they're going to be there in Egypt, and then I'm going to take them out of there. That's a promise. The Bible is filled with promises. God tells us in advance things he wants to happen and things he has planned to happen. Exodus 3.8, I came down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now this is Moses. God is making a promise. God says, I promise you're not going to stay in Egypt. I'm going to deliver you. God makes promises to every single believer. He makes universal promises. They're not unique to you. Everyone can get in on them. They are meant for everyone. He promises deliverance from sin, provision financially, fruitfulness. Second Peter 1, 4, we've been given exceeding great and precious promises. And then God makes individual promises. God may reveal to you something he's going to do for you. It will be unique. It will not be the same as the person sitting next to you, perhaps. He promises son to Abraham and Sarah, Zechariah and Elizabeth. That's an individual promise. But in this text, God says, I don't want you to just sit around and wait for promises to be fulfilled. Here's the problem. Some people are not looking for the promises to be fulfilled. They obey because they're good-hearted, but they don't have any faith. They can look in God's Word, see what God promises every believer. If you're a believer, that's what you should have. Or they have had God reveal His will through speaking personally or the Word of God coming alive or a prophecy or a word of knowledge. But they don't have any faith that that is actually going to happen. You know, it's possible to pray faithfully, meaning you're always doing it, without any faith that it's actually going to be fulfilled. Acts 11, 16, Peter continued knocking when they opened the door and saw him. They were astonished. What are they doing? They're having a prayer meeting. Peter had gotten arrested and thrown in jail. They're having a let's get Peter out of jail prayer meeting. Oh, God, get Peter out of jail. God, you got to get God. Oh, bring him. Can somebody get the door? And there's Peter. It's like, it's Peter. That's what you prayed for, right? The first girl that the Bible says that when she opened the door, she, it's like, no way, and slammed the door, <laughs> ran away. Who was it? Peter. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 2, the word which they heard did not profit them or do them any good because they didn't mix it with faith in those who heard it. Old stories told about a woman 
heard the pastor preach about faith. He heard the pastor say, you can say to the mountains, be removed and cast into the sea. She lived in a mountain area. When she got home, she looked out of the curtains and said to the mountain, in the name of Jesus, be removed and cast into the sea. Went to bed. In the morning, she opened up the curtains and when she saw the mountain still there, she said, just what I expected. Because that's how a lot of people live. They say the right words, but they're not actually expecting God to do anything. In the text that we just read, God says the spirit that you should have as you live for Jesus is this, you should live with expectation. If God has spoken, you should expect his word to come to pass. Expectation means voluntary anticipation. It has the idea of at any moment, verse 11, this is how you must eat it, be fully dressed as if you're going on a trip, have your sandals on and your walking stick in your hand, and the Bible says, eat it in a hurry. Why? Because at any moment, the call could come out, we're out of here. So he's saying, I want you to be expecting God to help you. We need to add to our prayers expectation, which is faith. We should, ex we should anticipate that the thing we're praying for should happen. Acts 14, 9 and 10, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed said with a loud voice, stand up straight and uh, on your feet. And he leapt and walked. This man came to church expecting God to heal him, and he did. There's something powerful about living with, with expectation. Elijah prayed for rain, and then he sent his servant and said, go look, are there any clouds? Six times, no, there's nothing. The seventh time, he prays again, go look for a cloud, and this time he says, there's a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. He said, that's it. Get, we better run because the rain is coming. He was praying and expecting God to answer his prayer. Psalm 81, 10, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. It's the picture of a baby bird. Baby bird doesn't go... Open your mouth wide. I'm not going to open my mouth really wide. That'll be embarrassing. You'll see. <laughs> Probably things you shouldn't see. <laughs> open your mouth wide. The baby bird is expecting the need to be filled. You know what? When you live for Jesus, when you go on outreach, I sometimes would challenge people through the years on outreach before we go. Do you believe that today could be the day you could witness to someone, they could get saved, lock in, live for Jesus? Just like we saw the picture of uh, Gary and Roger, Harold Warner witnessed to them. But Harold believed that people would get saved. God bless him. There's numbers of people that got saved through Harold Warner. What about you? Do you actually believe that what you're doing is going to do something good and powerful? You should expect God to provide jobs. You should expect God to bless your business. You should expect the people you are praying for to get saved. You should expect to have miracle favor that people would want to help you. You should expect miracle money. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And God says that's the spirit of salvation. Live expectantly. And if you're expecting, it involves actions. You know, if you have true faith, you're going to act like God's word is true. Verse 11, this is how you're going to eat fully dressed as if you're going on a trip. Have your sandals on, walking stick in your hand. In other words, if you believe that God is going to 
take you out of Egypt, dress like it. Be prepared for it. Robert and Mary Moffat were missionaries. They labored in the nation of Botswana for 10 years without a single convert. Not one person got saved in 10 years. A friend in England sent them a letter and said, I want to I wanna send you a gift. What would you like me to send you? Mary Moffat replied, send us a communion set, for I am sure that soon we're going to need it for the converts. God honored her faith. The Holy Spirit moved uh, uh, on the people. Six people got saved, were converted to Jesus Christ. The communion set, their friend sent it. It got delayed in the mail. And the day before, Robert Moffat said, we are going to celebrate communion on Sunday. The communion set arrived. That's faith. I am expecting God to intervene. Expectation involves actions. One final thought, eating in a hurry. God says, don't just eat the meal, eat it you must be in a hurry. That's because the call to leave could suddenly come. So our first thought, be ready. Second, be expectant. And thirdly, eat in a hurry because God could suddenly, suddenly, you could be halfway through the meal and the word could come out. It's time to leave Egypt. God is telling us something that is of great encouragement here. Do you know this about God? He is able to suddenly turn things around. I know some things take time. They're gradual. Oh, but listen, sometimes in a moment, God can turn it around. Acts 9 verse 3, suddenly a light shone from heaven. Acts 16, 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's chains were loosed. That is the God that we serve. They are locked in shackles inside the prison. But suddenly, that is the God we serve. Suddenly everything changes. See, in our lives... There can be moments where God changes everything and he can do it suddenly. Second Chronicles 29, 36, Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced that God had prepared the people since the events took place so suddenly. That's the God that we serve. What I'm trying to say to you, God can surprise you. How many of you, just a little poll here, how many of you have ever been surprised Phone call, conversation, text, letter, email, and the news was not good. You ever had that? I'll, I'll let you on a little tip. If someone calls you at three in the morning, they're not calling to tell you you won the lottery, okay? I'm telling you this from experience. So we've been surprised by bad things, but our text says God can surprise you with good things. Suddenly, Everything can turn around. That is the God that we serve. He can shock you with an answer to prayer. You know the old story? Pastor, he, he had a little kitten. It was stuck up in the tree and they tried everything, offering food and milk and the kitty wouldn't come down. The tree wasn't sturdy enough so he could climb it. So he said, if I tied a rope to the tree and tied it to my bumper, I could just move the car forward and bend the tree low enough to get the cat. Great idea. So he did it, and it came down, and like a cart, you know what's coming next, don't you? <laughs> Do I have to finish this story? <laughs> sure enough, he's watching, like, almost low enough to, and the rope breaks, and he's, and this is a true story, actually. The rope broke, and the cat went, <laughs> He, the, that'll get you arrested these days. You know? <laughs> He's searching the neighborhood and he can't find the cat. He feels so bad for what he did to this cat. 
He said a few days later, he's in the grocery store. He had a lady who was one of the members of his church, and he saw that she had cat food, and he knew this, la this lady hated cats. And it was so shocking to him because she was so vocal about ha hating cats. He said, why, if you hate cats so much, why are you buying cat food? She said, you know that I hate cats. My daughter has been bugging me and bugging me. Can we have a cat? Can we have a cat? Can we have a cat? I said, no. And finally, I told her, she said, I'm going to pray for a cat. He said, if God says you can have a cat, you can keep it. She said, in the front yard, my little daughter knelt down and said, God, please give me. And this is a true story. She said she finished her prayer, and from the air, a cat fell out of the sky. And she said, if God brought it like that, how can I say no? <laughs> Listen, I am telling you, God can drop a miracle from the sky because I have seen him do that. I have seen people get saved that I would have said the day before, there is no way. And yet the next day, they were saved. I've seen God suddenly break through in fruitfulness. I've seen suddenly a church turn around. I've seen suddenly relationships be healed. Because that is God. He says, live ready, live with faith, and live believing at any moment. God can turn things around. And for every believer, listen, the greatest suddenly of all is the rapture, isn't it? As fast as you can blink, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, as fast as you can blink at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Oh, listen, that is the hope of every believer, is that suddenly God is going to take us home. Suddenly God is going to set everything right. True justice. This is the God that we serve. An old man was dying, and as he lay dying, a friend thought he was going to be helpful by quoting a few things from the Bible, and this man made a reply. He said, don't worry about me. He said, I sealed the roof when the weather was warm. In other words, I'm ready now. That's my question. Are you ready to go? Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, ready to go. I am giving an opportunity now. There are people that are here tonight that you are not ready. If the rapture was to happen tonight, if you were to die and stand before God tonight, some of you, if you would be honest, you are not ready to go. God would not be pleased with the way you're living because the Bible says sin separates us from God. You cannot enter into God's presence if you're living in sin. But I gave you good news. This story was about the Passover. It's looking ahead to the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, the one who died in our place, the one who never sinned, died to pay for our sin so that we can go free. On that night, God said, it's time to go free. There are people here tonight, you need to go free. And God can do that in a moment's time if you would believe on Jesus Christ. But the one thing I can't do for you, I can't make you get ready. You have to choose that for yourself. God put out the command and every person had to choose for themselves to believe God and to get ready to go. How many people are here tonight? You are not saved. You're not right with God. While our heads are bowed, if you want to pray tonight for God to forgive you and do a miracle inside of you, I want you to lift up your hand. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I need Jesus Christ. I'm not saved. Thank you. How many others? Join this one. I need to get right with God. Lift up your hand. Thank you. 
I see that hand. How many others? I need Jesus. I'm not right with God. I'm living in sin. I'm not ready to go, but I want to get ready. Lift up your hand right now. All across this place, others, you need Jesus right now. I'm not saved. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved in the past, but you went back to sin. Backslider, come home tonight. Get your heart right with God. How many would there be? Others, you need Jesus. You want to get right with God. Lift your hand right now as God would deal with people. Anybody else? As God is dealing with people right now. I want to turn from my sin. Amen. I want those that lifted up their hand. You meant that? Yes? You meant that there? Come here. I want to have some pray with you. Get out of your seat. Come right now. God bless you. If there's somebody near you that doesn't know Jesus, please deal with them. Give them courage so they can come and pray. Let's all stand up to our feet. I'm opening the altars ready to go. You're going to live ready. You're going to live expectant. You're going to believe, live believing that God can turn things around at any moment. We're going to sing while people are coming to the altar. Go ahead and sing, brother. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I, I need. need. He's all, all I need. need. He's all I need. Jesus. your heads right now Jesus asked some blind man he said what do you want me to do for you I want you right now with your head bowed what is 
the greatest thing you need God to do in your life. For some of you right now, it's, it's the face of your loved one that is not saved. Others of you, there's a desperate illness that you need healing from or someone you love needs to be healed. Others of you, it's, it's crushing financial pressure, a marriage problem, a relational conflict, whatever it is. I want you to believe God right now. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask the God who can move suddenly to come down and get involved in your need. Right now, God, you see what is on the heart of every person that is here. God, there are people, they're desperate for their loved one to be saved. God, don't let another day go by with them in sin. God, you must suddenly turn this around. God, you are able. Let scales fall from their eyes. Let them see. Let them see their sin. God, let them see their need. I am asking you, God, there are people here that are bound. They're addicted right now. Suddenly deliver them and set them free. God, there are people here. They need a financial miracle. They have no way to meet this need. I am asking you to open the windows of heaven. Intervene. God, there are people that are sick in their bodies. I speak to that sickness right now. You will leave. In Jesus' name, I command their bodies to be made whole. They will function normally right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, healing power is going to flow. Oh God, you see every situation. You have more than enough power to meet every single one of these needs and more besides. And I thank you, Lord God. I am expecting you, God. I'm expecting you to help me personally. I'm expecting you to help our church, Lord God. I'm expecting fruitfulness and revival and favor, Lord God, in all that we're involved in. And I'm believing you, God, you're going to touch our churches, our pioneer churches. God, churches that we have out and they're stuck with no growth. God, suddenly you're able to turn that around. I speak it right now in the name of Jesus. God, do a suddenly miracle for us. And I'm thanking you in advance for everything you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise right now. Let's thank God for his goodness. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord God, for salvation. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for healing and provision and fruitfulness. Praise God for his goodness. Thank God. I am believing God that God is going to help us. He's going to turn things around. And some of you, I want to hear testimonies of what God has done in you, what God has done for you, what God is going to do through you. You let us know so that other people can be encouraged. Let's bow our heads. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Uh, you pay attention to those uh, announcements that applied to you. And let's come back this weekend. God is going to do great things and he's going to help us. With our uh, heads bowed, uh, I am going to uh, ask Anthony Cassio to dismiss in prayer. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed.